I run the information and referral service in Massachusetts for people with disabilities. And we have thousands of listings of doctors and dentists and occupational therapists, physical therapists, you name it. And uh, we give all that information away for free. And uh, we also have our Autism Insurance Resource Center. And what we do is we help individuals and families get insurance coverage for ABA services, OTPT, whatever they need for their, uh, their loved ones with autism. Okay. How's the microphone coming? Good? Good? Okay. Great. Okay. So before I start, um, let me just go to the first slide. I want to explain a couple things. Uh, so I am legally blind, and there are a couple implications here. One is that I'm using assistive technology right now. I've got a pair of headphones on, and I'm listening to my computer talk to me, and so it tells me what you see on the screen, okay? Uh, and when it comes time for questions, I'm unlikely to see you raise your hand. So if you could just raise your hand and say, question, I, I, I should be able to locate you, and hopefully somebody will help me do that. Okay? I come from uh, the Eunice Kennedy Shriver Center. Since the 60s, we've been, our focus is research, training, and service related to autism and intellectual disability. We have a long history of developing reading technology and, and other technology that we have received lots of federal funding for and that we've made commercial products with for the regular classroom. Disabilityinfo.org is the site I just showed you with all of the information for people with disabilities in Massachusetts. I have some partners in this project that I'm going to be talking about. Worcester Polytech University. Um, it's basically the MIT of Central Massachusetts. It's uh, a, lot of smart, a lot of smart kids there. Uh, and I am using them for their user. I'm, uh, they're, they're my partners because of their user experience lab, because they've got lots of experience with eye tracking, which you'll see later why that's important and uh, students, student power, lots of that. Also from UMass Boston, their artificial intelligence lab, natural language processing is their expertise, and they've given me a bunch of grad students to help me with this project. <coughs> IBM. IBM has been paying attention to accessibility since it was formed. And uh, they've got this great uh, IBM Aging and Accessibility Division, they're calling it now. Um, they know all about web accessibility, and they give me access to all kinds of resources, including the Watson engineers. And I, so I work regularly with them on this project, and you'll see why. Okay, my focus primarily is on web accessibility. And um, what that means is that you, I'm working to make the web usable by everybody, easily usable by everybody, including people with disabilities. And uh, my focus, as you'll learn, is cognitive disability, particularly autism and intellectual. Why is that important? Well, the web is pervasive. We get our jobs now from the web. We meet we socialize via the web. We really, our, our lives are being permeated more and more. When I, even though I'm talking about the web specifically, really everything I'm talking about applies to mobile technology as well, online education, which I, I, I'm hoping to remember to talk about a little bit later. 
There's an international organization called the World Wide Web Consortium. And it creates and updates every possible standard you've ever heard about for the web. HTML and CSS and security, uh, you name it. it. In 1998, it published its first set of accessibility standards for people with disabilities. In 2000, uh, sorry, in um, 2008, yep, was the next set, and the next set now is going to be 2018. And for the very first time, after some lobbying, the World Wide Web Consortium is not just paying to people with physical disabilities, particularly the blind. If you're blind, you have the most trouble of all people with physical disabilities using the web. 99% plus of websites are not designed to be accessible. And so you have to just slog through site after site and do your best and maybe not even ever get to the content. That's how bad it is. With cognitive accessibility, it's not just about design. It starts with design because people with cognitive disabilities also have physical disabilities. It's common. And so you have to start with foundation of accessibility to people with physical disabilities. And then for the people with cognitive, you have to pay attention to the content. The content has to be accessible to them too. And when I, when I talk about cognitive accessibility, I'm talking about the spectrum, the range of, on the low end, people with intellectual disabilities, which is the new term for mental retardation, to on the high end, everybody as we age. You know, we start to lose our memories. We start not to be able to think clearly. This is going to happen to every one of us. And on top of that, of course, you're going to, have, you're going to acquire physical disabilities. Your hearing's going to go. Your sight's going to go. People who are seniors don't like to think of themselves as people with disabilities because that means that their independence is, in thre is threatened, right? But that's the case. Okay. What, so I, as I was preparing this presentation, I was thinking about all the different trouble that people with cognitive disabilities have and um, I, of course, focused on autism. I want to say up front, and I, I was talking about this a little, a little while ago, that there's a growing movement among people with autism to say, we don't have disabilities. Autism is not a disability. Autism is just another kind of person. And to think, to think about us as having a disability is doing us a, a disservice. The only other population that I know of that does that is the deaf. For decades, they want to be called the deaf, not people who are deaf. Okay, they, the deaf with a capital D. They're proud to be deaf. It's a cultural thing. And I think uh, it looks like autism, autistics, that movement is going that way. Okay, so anyway, um, the problems that people with autistics have with the web are inconsistent interfaces, right? Inconsistency in people with autism, uh-uh, doesn't go well. Distracting stimuli, ads, okay? Ads are, are, blinking ads are the worst, right? And then you have extraneous content, you know, on the left or the right, or it has nothing to do with the main body, it's just some kind of built-in advertisement or, some upcoming conference or whatever. Attention span, concentration time, that's, uh, that's a problem as well. Now, small text sizes. Something interesting is that across the spectrum of cognitive disability, people find it's easier to understand text if it's larger. Okay? And then finally, Non-literal text. People, uh, autistics have trouble with metaphors and jargon and non-literal, like it's raining cats and dogs. 
I don't know who, where that came from, but you know, they don't, they don't, that's just not something, even if they've heard that, that they understand that. Okay, so it's really important to me that you understand that it's all about the content for these folks. Okay, so how do we, how do we ameliorate that? How do we address that? Well, one way is that we can provide content to them in the way that they understand it best. And maybe that's via video, and maybe that's via text, and maybe that's via text with contextually relevant images. And maybe that's text to speech. They can hear the speech, the, the text on the page read to them rather than having to read it themselves. Focus their attention. Okay, don't have all those extraneous things on the page or give them a way to see the page without it, which is actually easy to do. Use plain language, as I mentioned, literal and jargon-free, and the text with images. Okay. I have a dream, and this is it. This is my dream. I want to make web text so simple it can be understood the first time it is read by everyone. By far, the most common content on the web is text. Okay? And if you think about your own interactions with websites where you're, the classic is you're given terms of service that you have to click a button for to get that app or get to that website or whatever, who reads them? I bet not one of you in here. And why? Because they're so complicated, right? And, and, and maybe even intentionally so. But uh, uh, I'm going to get to, oh, I'm starting to get excited. <laughs> uh, <laughs> all right. So I'm going to go to my next slide to make my next point. <clears throat> in 2010, the U.S. government published the Plain Language Law. It requires federal, any, well, it requires federal agencies to explain to the public what they do simply. So can you imagine if the IRS had just plain, simple language that everybody could read and understand? How much easier it would be to do your taxes, right? And maybe someday that'll happen. Just because the law was passed doesn't mean it actually happened, okay? There are also international plain language standards. So it's not just the U.S. who are working on it. So what my project is about, what this research is, is about, is simplifying web text on a mass scale, on an enormous scale, as a service, perhaps. And the way we're approaching it is two-pronged. In the short term, we are taking these plain language rules and we're operationalizing them. And what I mean by that is, let's say that the plain language rule is use short sentences. Well, what's a short sentence? We can say it's 10 words or fewer. Okay, 10 words or fewer is something that people can understand, that computers can understand, okay? So we're, that's what we're doing is we're making them concrete and easy to follow. We're also paying attention to the order in which they're applied. And if we can develop a system that humans can follow to reliably create simplified text, that's our goal, and that's what we're doing in the short term. And in the long term, we're going to, and we are, developing Watson's capabilities to perform text simplification. And I'll be demonstrating that, the, the, the current state of it. Okay, so I already said that we're making the plain language standards easy to follow, to simplify. And it's not just enough 
to do something like that, you have to prove that it works. Okay? So what we're doing is we are bringing people into our lab, people with autism, people with intellectual disabilities, and we're showing them passages that we take, or text passages that we take right from a website, no alteration, there it is, and then we're showing them text that we've simplified using our operationalized rules. The two, group, the two texts have nothing to do with each other, so there's no bias there. And we're asking them about the text, each text, two literal questions and two inferential questions. And we're judging their comprehension based upon that, those data. What we're also doing is using eye tracking. It's, you see, when you, if you're asked, we could, we could just say to them, hey, do you understand this? And they say, sure. Well, that's, that's self-report, that's not going to work, and, and maybe uh, it's not just enough for them to have correct answers. We really want to see for ourselves as much as possible if they can understand the text. So here's a, here are a couple of examples. On the screen is your, pa pa your paragraph. On the left and on the right are the questions. Okay. And with eye tracking, if the person is reading the question and going back to the text, and then going back to the question, and then going back to the text, and they're doing that frequently, maybe that's an indicator that they're that not understanding. That, so that's a possibility. Another is pupil dilation. And apparently, pupil dilation is a measure of cognitive load. And so we can measure their, you know, how much uh, effort they're engaging in to understand the text. This is a, just a flyer for us uh, recruiting people. And we're paying them. Uh, every time they come in, we pay them 50 bucks. So, you know, I, I just want to say that their, people with disabilities, their time is valuable too. And we should be paying them, and that's what I do. Okay. I, kinda, I guess I, I'm kind of jumping ahead of my own slides, but. Um, this is a, a, just an image of a, an eye tracker. And uh, there are different kinds of eye tracking. The, the, uh, there's another, the, the most common kind is really not worn. It's just a bar at the bottom or the top of the screen. And it's calibrated to your, your eyes. And it's usually you have glasses and you get a little dot. And there's a bunch of calibration to do. Um, but the cool thing about this, I think, is we know technology advances like that very, very fast. We know that it comes down in price very fast. And I can tell you that eye tracking is going to be built into our tablet phone, our tablets and our phones, right? Because advertisers are going to love that because they're going to see what you're paying attention to, right? And that's going to be a really great measure of how effective their ads are. So I bet you that I'll, that reason alone will power that revolution. Okay, so now we come to the, this idea of mass scale text simplification. It's impossible, it's practically impossible to write rules for a computer, for, uh, for, an, for AI to understand language rules, okay? Maybe the kinds of operationalization we're doing for the plain language rules, we can help Watson to recognize, go out on the web and just search for bodies of text that are that's simple, and they and they already exist. Uh, and I'll I'll be uh, well. Here's an example. How many of you know, for instance? So everybody knows about Wikipedia, right? Yeah. So did you know there's a simple Wikipedia? Yeah. Ah, great! <laughs> First time that's happened to me. Yeah. So somebody, uh, there's a group of people are. Uh, you know, basically simplifying Wikipedia articles and, uh, and, and putting them up on the web. I want to say, too, before I go on, that simplifying text is not just helpful for people with cognitive disability. It's helpful for people who, in our country. There's a large population of people who are functionally illiterate, have very low literacy. That's one. Another is uh, non-native language speakers. 
right? The simpler you can make your own language, the easier someone whose English is a second language to understand, for instance. And on top of that, and this is really cool, there's, an, there's a, I know I'm getting excited again, so. Um, so, so there's a, there's a, I'm not, I'm not going to really go into this, but there's another kind of model that we could potentially use with AI, and it's called machine translation. And this is what Google does with its uh, translation service, right? And in, Google announced uh, a few months ago that in a nine-month period using machine learning, it made, it advanced its translate more than it ever had in all the years that it existed. And if we can think of simple language as a, n another language, you got typical language and you got simple language, then maybe we could apply that kind of technology to this problem. Okay? The way that we plan to do it so machine learning is all about pattern recognition. Okay. The way that the public first, I think the first time it really came into the public consciousness is um, Google sent its AI out across the web and said, go recognize cat pictures. Here are millions of cat pictures. And it then recognized the patterns of what cat, cats look like and, were able, and then was able to recognize it, them on its own, okay? Okay. And that's what we're going to do with Watson. We're going to give Watson data and let it learn on its own. We're not gonna code anything. What we're going to do is we're going to feed it perhaps millions of aligned sentence pairs, typical text and simplified text, so that it can see not only what simplified text is, but how it compares to typical text. Natural language processing as you can see on the, on the board here, on the, on the screen, basically it's, you anal, you, you, you've got an AI that analyzes, understands, derives meaning from human language in a smart and useful way. So I'm gonna give you a great example of that, and it's Watson. In 2011, Watson beat Jeopardy champions at their own game over and over and over again. And when you think about what it took for a computer to do that, you know, Jeopardy is all about cultural innuendo and cultural references and slang and, uh, and for, the, for the computer to be able to, for the AI to be able to parse that, was, it, was a, it was a great feat. Sorry about that. And there, there is my slide about it, of course, jumping ahead. Okay. When I learned about the Jeopardy feat, I approached IBM and I suggested to them that we, this, this is a general idea, that perhaps we could use Watson to simplify text on a mass scale. And the way that I was envisioning it at the time, and we're still considering, is that we summarize a, 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 an article uh, or a paper or a business report. We summarize it and then we simplify the summary, okay, which would perhaps be a lot less work and be quite effective anyway. I've done some experimenting with that, uh, creating what I think of as, you know how you, well, like on academic papers, you have an abstract. On business reports, you have an executive summary, okay? It's the same idea, we, and we would, so perhaps all we would have to do is simplify the abstract, simplify the business summary, may, you know, that part of it may, may be already done for us, right? And uh, essentially, 
I had some other ideas. And, and the Watson engineers, Will Scott in particular, have made a API, uh, a, a, they made a basically a software application that you can use to implement these ideas, and that's what I'm going to be demonstrating now. Okay. The, the, the app is called the Content Clarifier, and it does a few things. And I'm going to be honest with you all throughout about how well I think it's doing those things, which is not so well. Okay. But it's a first attempt. Okay. So essentially, it's doing three things. It's got three services built in. It's simplifying text, it's summarizing text, and it's enhancing text. And then they call it, later you'll see, there's an ultra mode, which is uh, sum summarize and simplify. Okay. So this is what the app is doing. It's replacing long words with short, not just short wa words, but commonly used words. And w w w do you remember, uh, I'm sure you all have remember years ago that Google was uh, 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 scanning millions of books, okay? And one of the benefits of that work was that we discovered what, com what words are common in our language, and, and from a historical perspective too. But, uh, and they made a, a word to vec, it's called. It's, a, it's an API that you can call to, to make those kinds of judgments. Another thing that it does is what uh, the content clarifier is that it substitutes literal language for euphemisms and jargon and colloquialisms, okay? And um, it's, you know, so instead of saying it's raining cats and dogs, it just says it's raining a lot, right? Okay. Summarizing. There are a couple of uh, approaches to summarizing, typically, in, um, in this field, and they are extraction and abstraction. Okay? So extraction means, that, and this is really the only one that's used, okay? it just means that the, 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 the AI is do, going to do its best at determining which sentences to extract from the text body in their entirety to form a summary. Okay. And not just that, but make them as coherent as possible. So, so for instance, if the second sentence you read refers to him or he or she, or th then the sentence before that has to have the she or he or him, right? And so it has to do those kinds of things too. The, the abstraction part is it's, it's trying to figure out what the text is about and generating a summary about it, and it, it just it can't do that at this point. Okay. Enhancement. In this case, what the app does is it looks for topics within the text body, and then it goes out into uh, re various resources such as Wikipedia, and it gets extra content about those topics. And you'll, and you'll see that in action shortly. And then it presents uh, this information, okay? So I want to talk about another thing I'm working on, which is <clears throat> online education, okay? This is the, the future for everybody. And we cannot leave out people with disabilities from this revolution. We cannot do that. For years, I talked to Blackboard, and I, the big gorilla of learning management systems, and I said, hey, what do you think about making your product accessible to people at this? Nope, not interested. Nope, nope, nope. Every year, the same. And finally, the University of California public school system, university system, said to them, we're never going to buy your product because it's not accessible. And overnight, all the resources the Blackboard told me that didn't have to do this, they did. And, and I, I monitored their progress, and they got to a point, to their credit, where they were independently, their, their Blackboard learns uh, 
version 11, Service Spec 9 or something. It, it got to a point where it's finally accessible, rated by a very respected third-party accessibility company. Now I'm trying to introduce, I'm trying to convince Blackboard to pay attention to cognitive. Let's, hey, what about all of those college students who are in college learning programs, like these are the programs that help their students with dyslexia, right, dyscalculia, which is the, the math, math uh, dyslexia, and others, they've got, they've got all kinds of students, even right in their own schools. And if you can sell a product that could help these students, I think that you are going to sell a lot more of that product. Okay. So I'm, um, what I'm doing is th that I'm not only am I building online courses that are using best practices of web accessibility, but I'm also going to be building in a virtual tutor. This is an idea where maybe eye tracking is, or, or your answers to questions are detecting that you're not doing well with the content. And then the uh, virtual tutor might say to you, oh, here's a, here's a simple explanation, or hey, here's a video about it, or hey, would you like to hear this text rather than read it? You know, there are all kinds of things that it could do. This kind of stuff excites me. Just like that. Okay. Uh, oh, okay. So um, th there have been a couple of articles recently in MIT Tech Review and Forbes about this work. And so, if you're interested, uh, I'm gonna. The last slide is gonna have a um, a link to my presentation. This presentation you're seeing here, and it has all the links to all these resources in it. And not only that, it's accessible. So if you're blind, you can read my whole PowerPoint presentation. Okay. So what I'm going to do now is um, I'm just going to go over a little bit of a summary and then I'm going to show you a little video, a three minute video of the content clarifier in action, okay? Uh, what I'm saying is design, accessible design, you have to make sure your mobile apps and your websites are compatible with assistive technology like screen readers like I'm using. Single switch devices. Have you ever wondered how someone with quadriplegia or, or, or who is paralyzed, use a computer? Sure. Yeah. Uh, and here's, they, so it basically comes down to, you could have a big button to the right of your keyboard that you just <laughs> smash with your fist if that's all you're capable of, okay? And on the screen is a table, and there's, it's an automatic scanner of a bar that goes, so you, you have your alphabet, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, right? And it, so you hit, the, you hit the button when it gets down to the row of the letter that you want, and then you, it starts going column by column. You hit it again, and it chooses B, right, whatever it is. And also, it learns your, the, the words that you most frequently use, and it starts to string sentences for you quickly, okay? People with quadriplegia, they can use what's called a sip and puff device, where they have a, basically a straw in their mouth and they're controlling their keyboard by blowing and sucking, okay? All right, um, so anyway, design, accessible content as I've been talking about, text simplification by humans, and then the Watson mass scale automatic text, that's the dream. IBM, uh, when, I, when I approached them and with this idea, they went to their banking industry customers and they said, what do you, what do you think about this idea? And the customers said, we love it because we think that if we could explain our products simply, we could sell more of them. And so IBM was sold, just, just on that alone. What was Blackboard's response to your second request? Uh, so the, it's been a continuum, essentially, of, that's very interesting, we're interested, silence. Silence, 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 Con contact, oh yeah. That's interesting. Yeah, I'd like to do that, silence. So. Okay, so this is my, uh, before we get to the video, this is the uh, last slide. This has the, um, the, the bit.ly link to my presentation. Um, so if anybody's interested, they can pick, take a picture of it or just write it down. I, I try to make it as easy to uh, read as possible. And it's essentially all capital letters. Uh, so it's bit, I'm sorry, it's bit.ly, bit.ly, 
all caps RMBI 2017.